Good morning. I would like to welcome you to First Presbyterian Church of Pasadena, whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you're joining us online. Today, we, I would like to welcome the Reverend David Wells to our service as our guest preacher while Dr. Fair is on continuing education. David has been in our, in our, in our church before. He is, um, was a missionary in Thailand and most recently has retired as a port chaplain in the port of Houston. And we welcome you today. If you'll notice, the beautiful flowers today are given in the glory of God in memory of Mary, given in memory of Mary Monroe Doris by Susan Doris Barcello and Margaret Doris Barden. Thank you, Margaret. If you have not already picked up the, the friendship folder that's in the, that is in the uh, pew, would you please pick it up and sign it? There are several announcements that I want to bring your attention to. First of all, um, there is a quilting class that um, Donna Gilchrist will be leading. The first session will be this Thursday, the, uh, the 29th. There are two sessions, one at noon at 12 o'clock and one at 6.30 in the evening. So you can pick and choose which one. It's a three session uh, training class and she guarantees that it's uh, quilting for dummies. So if you're like me with no experience, she would be glad to help you. Uh, this week, there will be no brown bag and Bible since, um, since Fairfax is on continuing ed. Next Sunday, the session has called a congregational meeting following worship to elect officers for the class of 2025. Also next week, and I think there may be flyers in the in the uh, pews is our global peace and global witness offering. Uh, this enables the church to promote the peace of Christ by addressing systems of injustice in our own communities around the world. 25% of it will stay locally. And I would also like now to invite Mark Corder to come up and give a minute for mission on Kairos. Good morning from Kairos Prison Ministry. In the next year, beginning this October to the October of 23, we're gonna do five Kairos events. Three at Carol Vance or Jester Unit 2 and two at Jester Unit 3. Um, it costs $12,000 an event to put on. I think you can count on one hand the time I've came to this sanctuary and asked for money, but we don't have $60,000. I don't think you do either, and I don't want you to give it to me and see that'd be nice. Uh, in a plain, plain brown bag would be good. Uh, anyway, I, we're looking for $60,000 to put on these five Kairos events. Plus, we still need all the other things we're doing, like the placemats, cookie bags, cookies, letters, we still need all that stuff, but we're gonna do five Kairos events in, a, in the space of a year. I never have asked the church to sponsor Kairos because I felt like it was something that you as a person in the church should just give from your heart. Whenever you feel like it, you give something to Kairos. It's always been that way and it's been, it's been working, but this time we really, need some financial help. And so I dug around in the scripture, there's always something in there that talks about it. If you go to 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, remember this, a farmer who plants a small, small seeds only receives a small crop. A farmer who plants a generous seed reaps a generous crop. You must, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly. If you don't think you want to, don't. 
or don't give under pressure. Just because I'm standing here begging you for it and I'll probably punch you out at the door, don't give under pressure. For God loves a cheerful giver. There's always enough. Anytime you do something for God, it seems like you don't have enough, but then he always gives you a way to attain. So I'm asking you today to help us attain enough to put on five Kairos events in the next year. Thank you. Let us worship God together. As you all know, during the summer, uh, I started playing some arrangements by the, I guess, world-famous Diane Bish. Uh, She is probably one of the greatest living organists uh, that we have today, and she truly plays for the glory of God. Um, A good friend of mine, Melba Slavin, commented the very first time I played an arrangement of hers and said, oh, that's the joy of music. Because Diane Bish has played organ concerts throughout the world, bringing the joy of music to everyone. So like many of the organists of the 20th century, she has brought the beauty of the organ to the masses. Just like Bach tried to do in his day, even though no one could play his music unless they had lots of talent, the same thing is happening with, with Diane Bish. I'm humbled that, that I can even stretch my hands enough to play these chords. Uh, the thing that Diane does is that she imparts her love of music and her spirit of the Lord into the music. And when I, think, when I play these pieces, I think of my good friend Melba Slavin, who is now recuperating. And I want to dedicate this beautiful piece to to Melba and that she get well uh, quite soon. It's called For the Beauty of the Earth. You will recognize it.
please stand in body or in spirit and join me as we do the call to worship. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, who rules over all things, gathers us in love. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Let us offer our praise and thanksgiving. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, <clears throat> let us confess our sin to God, using the prayer of confession as printed in our bulletin. God of justice and righteousness, you lift up the lowly and fill the empty, yet we adore the high and the mighty among us. You reach out to the poor, yet we continually pursue wealth. You talk about treasure in heaven, yet we want a big balance in our accounts right now. Correct our misguided ways. Forgive our lack of generosity. Free us from striving for more and more. Change our hearts so that we tend to do things that matter and find our life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Friends, believe and live the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. In the midst of the multitude of words in our daily lives, speak your eternal word to us that we may respond to your gracious promises with faithfulness, service, and love. Amen. The New Testament reading is from 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 19. Of course, there is a great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blemish until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only the sovereign the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immorality, immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing for, up for themselves treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of life that really is life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I guess I'm not working hard enough. Uh, Fairfax said, I'm still your favorite. I said, how can I be their favorite? I'm preaching the gospel. <laughs> I, I don't want to be their favorite. <laughs> Actually, I'm joking. Thank you very much for inviting me back. You know, I try to use the lectionary so that I'm not preaching the sermon of David gospel and trying to preach the sermon on God's gospel. Well, lo and behold, what lectionary reading popped up and hit me in the face this week? We just read it. Let me ask you, I want you to raise your hand if you hate money. Raise your hand if you hate money. No one? Well, let's try this again. If you have never struggled with money, 
to pay your bills or make it in life. If you have never struggled to come up with enough money to pay your bills or make it in, in life, raise your hand. You've never, you've never struggled. Wow, I need to meet you after the worship service. I, need, <laughs> I didn't think I'd get a hand on that one. That's wonderful. There actually, there, there are a few, there are a few, but most people have struggled in one way or another to make enough to pay their bills or to make it in life in a way that they want to live. If we talked long enough, probably no one would raise their hand. But anyway, let me just come back to this later because I'm going to come back to this. When my boys were growing up, I watched them like a hawk. My oldest, when he was in first grade, I discovered that he had a learning disability, fairly severe learning disability. Well, I kind of guessed that he might not get through college. And so I kind of guessed that he probably was going to struggle with finding a career and making enough to, to get by. So I said to him one day, before he had found his niche, I said, never work just because you need the money and to make enough. But work because you love and are passionate about what you do. Well, about uh, 10 years after that, I thought, did I say the wrong thing? He was still looking for that niche. And dad was kind of having to support a lot of that. He, tried, he, di he didn't go to college, and he wasn't able to make that, and I knew that. He became a firefighter. First, he was a gymnast, and he was a coach. He couldn't make enough as a coach to even survive. And then he was a firefighter, and he went through firefighter training, and that didn't work out. And then he went to CrossFit training. And then finally, two or three years ago, he found his niche. And he loves what he does, and he can't stop talking about it. The worst thing you can do is ask him about neuromuscular massage. Don't ask him because you'll be there for at least an hour. He loves it. And by the way, he, he's making more than his dad's ever made as a preacher. Then my youngest son, when he was a year and a half old, I knew he was smart. He's a self-learner. I knew it. My wife and I spotted it immediately. He was never going to struggle with learning, and he didn't. And he learned so easily. And after he graduated with his bachelor's degree in engineering, I pulled him aside, and I said, Andrew, I want to share three things with you. Number one, never complain about paying your taxes. Because if you make enough to pay taxes, then you need to be paying them to give back to the society and to those others that may need some of that tax money for whatever reason. Number two, never think that you deserve what you make. And he looked at me and he 
puzzled. And I said, never think you deserve what you make because there's always someone that works harder than you do and barely makes it on the money that they get. Don't ever think you deserve what you make. It is a blessing that you get what you get. And number three, Always be generous. Now, why did I say that to him? I knew he was going to have lots of money in his future. How did I know that? Well, he graduated with an engineering degree, and he was above average. And he ended up working for an oil and gas company in the engineering, and he started with a really good salary. Not only that, after four years, or after a few, a couple of years, Amazon grabbed him in their management to work in management for Amazon. And he made, made even more money. And then after four years of doing that, Tesla grabbed him. At 34, he's senior manager of construction for all of Tesla and now works in their headquarters in Austin. I won't tell you how much he makes, but it's, it's a lot. And he's not through. Anything he wants to do, he will do. Yes, he works hard. Both my sons work hard because I always told them also, enjoy what you do. And do it with passion. Well, I'm glad I told them what they, what I told them. But there was another day that we were talking about money again. And I said to them, well, before I tell you what I said to them, let me tell you a woman. I was talking about this passage that we read today, and she's a good Christian woman. And, and I said, uh, do you love money? She's smart. She said, no, I need money. We all need money, but I don't love money. I said, okay, how much is enough to make it? How much is enough? And she couldn't answer me. So I asked my sons one day when we were talking about money, how much is enough to make a good life in America? It's a good thing they couldn't answer me either because the next statement or question was going to be a lot harder than that one. How much is enough? How much is adequate? Well, you say in America, it's never enough. Really? Really? It's never enough? Answer for your own life. How much is enough? Actually, when you get to be 70, <laughs> it gets a little bit easier. However, I have to ask myself, David, how much is enough? When can you stop? <laughs> Don't ask me that. I haven't stopped yet. I still get money. I still think about money. How much is enough? You know, everybody loves to talk about money. Well, unless you're preaching. Look at our politics. Oh, you knew I had to get into that, didn't you? We love to justify ourselves or justify our party or justify whatever with economics. Really? A good Christian nation, yeah. Economics, that's what we judge them by. Really? Are they a good person? Do they tell the truth? Are they generous? 
Do they want to help other people? No, we don't talk about that. We talk about, are they helping us and them succeed in economics? But don't blame the politicians. It's everywhere. It's all of us. It's all of us. Me too. But every once in a while, at our best moment, we might break ourselves or challenge ourselves from our own craziness. But many times we don't. In fact, I went to the, I, I didn't really, but I went to the casino and I won a big jackpot. Thank you, God. Oh, God, God doesn't, God didn't, God helps us with everything. It was God's blessing, right? No. Well, doesn't God bless us in everything? No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not everything you think is good is from God. It might be from the other end, down below. Now you think, David, you can't be serious about preaching like this. Oh, but I am. I really am. When the person who's struggling to make it, that, but they may be lazy. Yes, they may be lazy. I understand that. But they're struggling to make it. Let's assume they're not lazy. Do we want to help them out? Do we want society to help them out? Is it survival of the fittest? Everybody make their own way? Is that really the Christian life? All the good Christians who are trying to play politics, is that really what we believe? Really? Is that really what God's word and God's actions are all about? Now I'm about to get to the title of the sermon. This is just the prelude. This is the setting the stage because the lectionary set this stage for me. Now we're getting to the, the gospel reading, love of God. So I'm going to shift. Love of God is the antithesis to me of the love of money. So I'm going to talk with you about the love of God. God used to want us to follow rules, follow law, follow commandments. And, and they're still there. They're still there. But God decided, you see it all through the Old Testament, God decided it wasn't working. The faithful were not faithful. The followers were not following. It was failing God tried to legislate, God tried to demand, God tried to create the laws, and we stubborn humans that God created would not listen or would not follow. It's all through the Old Testament. So we come to the New Testament and God shifts gears a little bit. I will send them my son who is like them, and I will give him free will to do whatever they need to decide to do. Free will. And then I will have to let my son die so that they will understand me more clearly. Because what, what God really wants from us is not obedience, but a relationship interactive with us that moves in faithfulness and in love. And the only way he could show how stark 
and extreme that is, is to let his only son die at our hands. And we killed him. And we killed God's only son. Not just the Romans, not just that age, us. We killed him. And then he said, this is my beloved son who I love. And he loves us. And my beloved son loves you. And if you believe in him deciding to die for you, the unfaithful, I love you. Wow. Now we say that, but can we really feel and believe that in our heart? Because what God wants is a sacrificial servant. Are you willing to give up your life for others? Are you willing to live the life that Jesus lived? Are you willing to follow God who was willing to let his son die? I have to remember that whatever I preach, whenever I preach. Am I being sacrificial in my words? And do I accept God's fullness of his grace? You know, Mother Teresa once said, I don't know what heaven will be like, but I believe that when I die, when we die, I will not be asked how many good things did I do, but I will be asked how much love did I put in what I did. How much love of others did I put in what I did. Even if you're a good person, how much love of others do we put in what we do? Love, uh, love of money is a root of all evil. There are two other roots. <laughs> I'm not preaching on them today. The other two roots, as I conclude, are uh, the other two roots are ego, the personal ego, the self. And then the third one is control and power. Money, control and power, and ego. Somewhere those lead us into the evils that we find all around us. Love of God is weak. <laughs> it's sacrificial. It's willing to die for someone else. That's not something we want to shout around the world all that much, I don't think. But we love to talk about power and money and our self. And that also is what I have to remind myself of. Well, love of God, it's certainly not easy Love of money is much easier. I asked you earlier how many people hate money, but I didn't ask you 
How many people love money? And like that smart Christian woman, you might say, oh, I don't love money. I just need money. <laughs> and that's right. We do. Everybody needs money. It's true. There's nothing wrong with money. We need money. But where is the line and where does it come from needing money to loving money? And if the antithesis really is love of God, which works both ways. Some translations in the Bible, it says love of God means God loving us. And some translations, it goes the other way, us loving God. To be honest with you, love of God means us loving God and God loving us. It does go both ways. And that is what we are all called to do and be about. Amen. If you would stand with me and let us affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Well, we ha probably have lots to pray about. Uh, I always do. <laughs> so, and uh, of, of course, you may have things you want to pray about. If anyone would like to verbalize them out loud, you can do that now. If not, that's okay. But if you have some things you want to lift up publicly, uh, we can do that. Anyone? Okay. Well, I always want to pray for the church because it's always a struggle with the church uh, making it. I know that. I want to pray for. I want to pray for our government for sure. But government is not. I want to pray for all of those people who are believers or might be believers, that they will come to believe in our Lord more fully and pray for each of you in your personal struggles because everybody has struggles in life of one sort or another. So I want us to, even if it's in the silent moments of prayer, to pray for each individual here and the struggle that you are feeling or may feel in your future. So let us turn our hearts over to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you and our hope really is always in you. You are the only real hope 
for this life that we live day by day and for the life to come. Whatever else happens, your love and your care is always there with each one of us. Help us to feel that and to know that and to live that. Oh God, we pray for our nation and for all nations that there might be peace and that there might be tranquility in the lives of all of the peoples with the different nations. Our governments may be different. Our styles of life may be different. But you know that we are all your children, and you yearn for all of your children to live the life that you have shown us in Christ Jesus. Oh God, we pray that you will turn around all of those people that are doing evil things and bad things for the crime that we find in our world, for the difficult times that we find in responding to the issues of our world. Give us strength and courage to know that you are working with us. And, oh God, help us to listen. Help us to listen to others and help us to listen to you that we might find the correct directions of life. And now each of us brings to you our personal life issues, struggles, concerns, that you might hear them in this moment of silence. All of this we pray as our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would stand with me and we will sing together hymn number six, four, uh, 630. 630.
always remembering love which you have to give and the love which you are always receiving. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.